We're super happy to have Sabrina Moriale and Lorenzo Perry uh, from Lemonot, which is a platform for spatial and relational practices, um, architecture and performative arts. So Sabrina and Lorenzo, they're architects, educators, uh, and they graduated here from the AA, previously taught at INDA in Bangkok and at the Angewandte in Vienna. Uh, Sabrina currently teaches here at the AA, and together they teach um, at the RCA London. So their projects reinvent the relationship between urban fabric, uh, human rituals, through a range of media, and they constantly seek new forms of togetherness and conviviality, initiating unconventional acts of placemaking and proposing alternative narratives to critically rethink our practice. So I'll leave it to them. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much, guys. It's a pleasure to be here. It's good to see you, like, all present at uh, school today. Um, we were also teaching at the AA Summer School, so for us it's a really beautiful moment uh, to share with, uh, with you your, our projects. Um, thank you, Emma, for the introduction. I think you said everything, so I'm gonna skip this, actually. Uh, but um, we graduated together from the AA in 2016. We started working together, and we work in between disciplines. So that's why it's hard sometimes for architects. Uh, we're not recognized. Our completely strict architects, for artists, we're not artists, so it's like, it's interesting for us to understand where do we sit, at what scale we interact with architecture, and what does it mean to do this? Um, you guys yeah. are here also to get a glimpse of what the AA is, so we believed it was important like, to include where we started, because we really started our collaboration uh, at the end of our fifth year at the AA. We also graduated, Sabrina didn't say that, but we graduated on a very peculiar day, that it was the day of Brexit, 24th of June 2016. And that thing somehow defined also like our relationship with the city and with what happened after that. So we graduated with uh, two very different projects. We're very different, but we believe it's also like the richness of our collaboration. Not like to go in details, but I graduated like with a, with a sort of uh, Brewing factory and parliament for informal democracy in Burkina Faso, in Ouagadougou. I was really interested in playing with the geometry, with tectonics, and in understanding how certain spaces, which are related to the production, the consumption of food, in this case of beer, can and should be inhabited. And I was really interested in understanding how the tectonics can be manipulated, how the functional requirements should, be, should become things to play with, and how you can really construct super precise pieces of architecture where, again, like, are somehow pretest for like, playing with, uh, with languages, with iconography, and then you'll see certain things that are occurring in our projects, especially like the interest for animalistic, anthropomorphic uh, instances, and like, for the relationship between like, figurativism and geometrical abstraction. Uh, well, instead, uh, I graduated, my thesis project was uh, the construction of a pinball machine. As, a, as an allegory for cultural production. So what I was working with is this, uh, from this statement that always told me, like in school, they said, oh Sabrina, you cannot do architecture because you don't know how to draw, really. And I was stuck with this because I said, uh, how do we create, uh, how do we appropriate things? Uh, and how can we create our own language and archives or selection of elements through conversation, um, books, uh, artifacts from other people? We can steal from others because in the moment that we take it and make it ours, it just becomes you know, a different project. Uh, so this machine was operating on three different levels and it was uh, played by multiple players. And every t it was actually a, a completely working pinball machine and every time that someone would play in collaboration with each other or in negotiation with the space, um, a different play field, a different drawing would come out of it. So no matter how you understand this mechanism, because between architects, clients, stakeholders, you create your own way to build your world. And I mean, what was really fascinating, like, at, and when we started collaborating, is like, again, like, this is really an allegory of what Sabrina said, like, of cultural production. This is something that somehow we try to incorporate in our project, acknowledging the fact that sometimes perseverance, endurance is more important than strategy, and, and actually action sometimes is more valuable than talent or whatever talent is. Like, meaning, like, this idea of like playing, trying, like, we feel like it's very important in everything that we do. So we wanted to start like from the very, very, very beginning, and now we are gonna jump 
to the end, showing you the last project that we, we worked on together. What you just show, what you, uh, what you just saw, is um, is an auction. It is the surreal staging of an auction. It is a short film that we realized for the Venice Biennale 2023 for this last architecture biennale, the the ongoing one. We were asked, we were commissioned a project about food transition in Sardinia, 
and we were working along the banks of the Cabras Pond, the Estanio de Cabras, and we are going to explain you more about it. Fulvio, so he's an auctioneer. He's a guy that takes care, preserves, protects, but that ultimately showcases and sells the content of this abandoned forgotten church close to the pond, close to the Stagno. Just to give you a bit of a glimpse of uh, the theme of the Italian Pavilion and the Benale this year, they selected uh, nine uh, studios, uh, architectural studios under 35, and they paired each studio with one advisor that didn't belong to the field of architecture. And we got paired with Roberto Flore, who is the head of the DTU Skylab, and he was previously working at Noma in Copenhagen, the restaurant. He directs the food lab within directs, the Skylab. Yeah. Um, so the project uh, was part uh, of a collective effort, uh, all these uh, nine studios together. Um, and they were happening before on the Italian territory, so outside yeah. of the pavilion, so that's why you saw the short film that was happening in Sardinia, and then they were brought back yeah. in here that you might recognize the space inside the premises of the Italian pavilion in the Arsenale in Venice. So the project was uh, uh, you know, made by me, Lorenzo and Roberto, and all of us uh, were uh, considered foreigners in a way because we are live abroad, uh, we come to Sardinia, we are Italians, but we don't come from that region. The region of Sardinia is very peculiar because it's an island and because it has its own language. So we had to deal with a project that for us was completely new, as if that you're going there. And it was very collaborative. So it was the three of us, but like to Tons. construct such a short film, the project, like the team was huge. And if you imagine, which is like multiplied by nine, like because in order to organize the collective exhibition in Venice, it's really a huge team. A bit of context about the place. So the, the Cabras Pond, the San de Cabras, is a very peculiar place northwest of Sardinia. And like it has a small city of 9,000 inhabitants, which is established since centuries on the production of Bottarga, which some of you might know what is it, otherwise we're going to explain you. The Bottarga is actually the fermented mullet row. So it's the ovary sacs of the mullet, which are extracted and they are fermented under salt, and it's quite a delicacy. It's quite an Italian delicacy that you consume on pasta, you can slice it very thin, and like this, it's produced in a lot of places in the world, but this one, like, is quite prestigious. So you have like this community that like is completely based and com on the production of it, and like basically survives only through producing it. One thing that maybe we didn't mention, sorry, is that we were given the advisor and our, our topic for this year for us uh, were food system, food transitions. Which is very hard, as you might encounter in these three weeks, as something to physicalize, to make tangible, like to address not only as a research topic, but as something that produces a piece. No. So what we were saying is that like, the community is entirely based from an economical point of view, like especially on the production of Bottarga. But like it's surrounded by an amazing landscape from a naturalistic point of view, like very diverse, very heterogeneous. What we were really interested in is trying to understand the mechanism of hyper-traditional products and the contemporary supply chains. So understanding their obvious controversies in terms of sustainability, but also how to address their indisable link through to like the identity, the culture, and the economy of a place. What's very interesting in there, like when we were talking like about diversity, heterogeneity, not only the landscape, but like but also the architecture of the Stagno is quite interesting. You need to know that like the Stagno has been until the 1982 the last private property in Italy, the last feudalistic properties, which is like quite late. So it basically it's surrounded by these like let's say mini cities where like the fishing compounds they were acting as mini cities, you will have like the palace of the owner, but like you will have the church. So you have like, so the, the place is really full of super interesting resources that are not really dignified. So what we were trying to say is that basically in such a case, food transition is not necessarily about food, but it, is it mainly about diversification? Is it mainly about like understanding that like the multiple resources of an area should be dignified? So then we started to look, uh, exactly, from food, uh, from the topic of food, we started to look actually at the architecture and the properties of the landscape and the dynamics or the historical references uh, that belong to the, um, to the city. So how to, make it, how to make this visible? So 
this intersection between architectural landscape and food systems and food production. So first of all, we decided to work with salt. Why salt? Salt is actually one thing that really exemplifies this intersection. You need to know that the Bottarga and the Mullet in there are really peculiar because of the peculiar low salinity of the Stagno. Since the Stagno communicates with the sea, with a series of very filiform channels, very fingery, so basically, like, what happens is that like, the exchange of water is very low, so the salinity is very low. But like, when it rained, like, there were actual floodings because of this low exchange. So there are like, certain neighbors of the city which, are getting flooded, which were getting flooded, so they were called Venezia. The way they addressed small, this... Small Venice. Little Venice. They basically okay. built a bigger channel, a wider channel called Canale Scolmatore, so to secure a larger amount of water flow, of water exchange. What happened is that the salinity was no longer low. And this, this is not necessarily a damage for the sun or for the pond, because like, new types of vegetation, of vegetation are developed, but like, it's a damage for the production of Bottarga, since like, the higher salinity somehow defies the production of certain types of Bottarga. So again, the people that were constructing the channel in order to address a need of the urban fabric, if you want an architectural necessity, are also the ones basing their economy only on the production of the Bottarga, which is damaged by that decision. So you do realize that like, the salt is the symbol of this intersection in such a peculiar place Everything involves simultaneously food production, architecture, and landscape. And I think that how we transform all of this knowledge into a design tool, that was the main question. So how architects usually do the sort of research and then they go into design, we try to merge the two pieces all the time. So we work in parallel. We do what we call embedded um, um, embodied research. Embodied research. So this, we started to collaborate, we want to work with salt, we knew that we wanted to collaborate with people that lived in, this, in the place, um, and we started to work in understanding if we could construct out of salt, salt as a material. So we just cook, you know when you cook fish and you cover it with salt and you put it in the oven? The same thing we did for these cones. So we did 588 salt cones as each one for each tile of the church. And we cook them in the oven together with the chef school, like the cooking uh, school in Oristano. Uh, and we just did um, salt water, cook in the oven for 25 minutes. And we collaborated with extraordinary people uh, from Cabras and uh, the cooking uh, Yeah, it was, actually, like, it was actually really a recipe. Because like, for example, 25 minutes is an average. It depends on the dimension. Yeah. The smaller ones, you would cook them for 10 minutes. The bigger ones, you will cook them for 40 minutes, but it's really how do you design with these things, and for example, the soil, how do you make tangible this intersection, again, between architecture, landscape, and food production. So each, each cone was also different from each other, and you're going to see why later this matters. But then, what to do with salt? So like, we're trying to explain you progressively how the project like, took place. So we wanted to represent this intersection. We knew we wanted to work within a piece of architecture that represents this diversity around the Stania, so that's why the church. We, know that we, wanted, we knew that we wanted to work with salt, but then, okay, what to do with that? So we realized that basically you need to know that like, this town is established on Bottarga, but like, everyone goes there for that. So at some point, the local fishing volumes were no longer sufficient. So what they started to do, they started importing fresh Bottarga from Venezuela, Greece, uh, Brazil, Mauritania. Mauritania, and they started just producing it in there. Of course, you do realize that like, in terms of logistics, this is like, really unsustainable. But of course, like, it's how the community supports itself. So what happened when we were there like, to brainstorm what to do, they did for the first time an auction, like, similarly to what happens in different places in Italy, like the truffles in Alba or like, the tuna in south of Sardinia, started saying, well, if we need to stop importing Bottarga from abroad and we need to live to survive just with a local one, we need to sell it for crazy prices. But then what happens is that you start fetishizing the product, like local buyers can no longer afford it. So again, like it's about trying to find a solution within the realm of food production. Why what we were trying to do and to say is that again, food transition is about diversification. Food transition is about understanding that multiple factors should pervade the equation and again an economical equation. So the auction became also a symbol of this intersection of this constellation of exchanges that took place worldwide. 
and for us uh, we started to be super super obsessed uh, with all the colors <laughs> and all the type of typologies of Botarga imported and exported Botarga but as well the kind of uh, um, top which is the inside of the mallet we have this to uh, on the right you have that type of botarga which means that if you see the botarga with that top it means that it's caught and processed in cabras why because that little top is the intestine of the mallet if you would import that it would go uh, rotten so that means that you know the botarga cut on the right uh, it's about 600 euros uh, and the other one is imported from the mediterranean or other other countries even though now like from greece they learned so like the ones which is import, which are imported from greece they keep on having the unga but like the, the point is like basically we wanted to stage this alternative option so like salt was no longer enough so like how do you really build a complex iconography that like allows you to make a commentary like on existing phenomena but that also allows you to, to transcend them. So we worked, so how to visualize these properties, how do, do we translate uh, from a performative point of view these, these qualities that we learned. We work uh, with the ceramic and we wanted to have, we, we designed 12 pieces as the 12 buffe of Botarga that were sold and uh, uh, those are ceramic uh, um, uh, sculptures with uh, a coating of salt cooked as well those in the in the kiln and what you were seeing like the peculiar geometry of those like with, the, with this sort of spike that of course like resembles like the peculiar top of the Bottarga that Sabrina explained to you before but also allowed Fulvio pragmatically to actually yeah. lift them so like what you were seeing before like this guy the auctioneer somehow interacting with these 12 special pieces um, the auction was for, real, no? And for us, the auction was the piece of art that we wanted to pro pr produce for the Biennale. And it was quite challenging because it's, uh, it's an auction that actually is immaterial, you know? It's something that is not physically there. It's going to be there just for a moment. And then um, when we move all our 588 cones from one wet wetlands to the other, to the Lagoon of Venice, we rep replicated the planimetry of the church. So what you see in there, it's the one-to-one -one reenactment, the footprint of the church, like with all the cones that travel to there, and which right now are transformed into a digital platform. As we were saying, it's a real auction. So it's a digital platform and people like can buy these cones to support integrated research between food production, architecture, and landscape. Like, I mean, you, might, you need to know that Italian bureaucracy is quite complicated, so the auction will be live this week. The last month like, was needed in order to resolve certain details, but look, so people from now on, you can go in Venice and you can actually buy these cons. So it's also like this idea how you can take advantage of like, the framework of the Viennale to support a project that like, sponsors research. As we were saying at the beginning, like, we found that like, food transition in such a space, it's mainly a research topic, so it should be addressed through research, but like we wanted also to make a tangible piece, so that's why the short film, that's why the sculptures, but that ultimately are media to engage and to, to trigger, like to cultivate research. So at the, our, our aim at the end is like, if you want to get a cone, we are going to send it to you back home. But then what we would like to have at the end of the Biennale is that nothing will be left out of our, our um, installation. So we made a partnership and between a local, yeah. a local NGO that does environmental analysis and we are going to work with our students here at the AA, at the Royal College of Arts and with the students of Roberto that like investigate food systems. So like really, like this, this salt, will really produce this fund for integrated research. Maybe we wanted also to show you the uh, kind of design behind the, uh, the Botarga. These are wax sculptures that we design as an altar piece at the end for the, for the stage, for the installation. Um, I, 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 we feel like that it's important again like what we're trying to, to explain is that like when you make this sort of project there are like some conceptual intellectual considerations but there are also some constraints that are happening in any design project so for example when we rebuild the one-to-one -one footprint of the church in Venice you do realize that like in Sardinia it worked because the church was contained because the church had a focal point an altar that we didn't have so in the pavilion in the Italian pavilion it would fluctuate a lot so we needed to rebuild this sort of focal point which is a purely 
design consideration how to do that. We decided to construct this gigantic Bottarga in wax, and the, the Bottarga has like quite an interesting materiality that wax can simulate, and then you've got to be serious if you want to work with that. Like you just saw like some geometrical dissection of the Bottarga. What does it mean to design it geometrically? What does it mean to design it with the tools that as architects we will have? What does it mean to actually make material investigations like what you see below is like you see wax in here. Like, and how, like, you cannot, if you go in Venice, you can smell it, you can touch it, and it has, like, a very interesting materiality that makes sense in relationship to the but original also ingredient. also, how, as architects, we use our softwares and tools uh, that we learn throughout our seven years of architecture, and we approach, you know, with a different fields, with sculptors, with people that just uh, help us to define even better the type of design, you know. We cannot come in and say this is exactly how it's going to look like because we need to leave uh, the material to speak to for itself. But also like, you want to work with someone that has an expertise in wax, but like you need to work together on a structure because if you want to have it like almost two meters high, you need to put like steel, you need to put like cables, like you, you really need to it's engineer an it. It's, it's, an a, it's an architecture. And for us, this interplay between like architecture, objects, figurativism, geometrical abstraction is something very, very important. Like a year ago, they asked us to design a playground on paper, and like we came up with uh, with this illustration where we were trying to assemble together like most of the pavilions, designs, pieces of architecture that we constructed in the last few years. I think one important. Um uh, thing to mention while we design is that we always play with scale and we try to understand at what scale can we approach the body, at what scale are we going to inhabit the building, when is it that something makes sense for our uh, you know, projects. And we work a lot with the scale of the object. Also at home we have a lot of prototypes and, and bits and pieces that we collect. Um, and this is something that becomes in our, you know, very involved in our daily ordinary life. Yeah, but. this is really similar to our table at home when we start designing something. It's really about like looking at things, scaling yeah. them up, scaling them down, and it's quite a serious process because it, it takes a lot of like transformations, a lot of delicacy, something that we experimented like in different places in the world. Like this one is about, without again going into details, but like it's for, us it's, a it's for us important, it's a project that we did with students in Thailand where we were trying to construct a geometrical dragon. We were trying to understand what does it mean to conceive columns as like feet, or what does it mean like to construct like a roof that like resembles like th th this sort of iconography but like dissected architecturally. Or for a very small project that we did like a few years ago, Sabrina was mentioning like body parts and how for us it's important and interesting to, to play with them and to understand how they can be transfigured. They asked us to, to design a suitcase. Yeah, uh, bottom valise, uh, the one of like a reinvention of Duchamp bottom valise. Um, and we started to understand how we could construct something that was portable. We were living in Thailand at the time, so we spent there two years. And we were supposed to come back just in time for this Milan Design Week. And we were having with us this like uh, luggage, small luggage uh, with an architectural project inside. So we started to play with the, how these objects could fit within each other. Um, and how, yeah, no, sorry. What we were having at the time, like really again, like we we're serious. We were sitting at the table, we were gathering our objects and we were having, we were having a teapot, uh, we were having like some prototypes uh, for an ongoing competition. And like what we did, like we were really, again, as you can see, they seem like super playful objects and they are, but they are like constructed quite seriously, quite architecturally if you want. Like this is how we're trained and this is how we manage to transform things. This is how we can really make things fit into each other, how we can really internalize and manipulate them. And so, and that's why we are quite obsessed with these constructions because like this helps us and this allows us to cook things, to really start from like the properties of things that we have around us, or to start from the properties of things that you would never think about them as like architectural ingredients, but they could become as such. It's very rare that we start the projects uh, from an architectural, from a building <laughs> reference. Uh, so we do put on the table various visuals uh, um, and then we try to also change the use of that same uh, design and, and form. Because like, we, construct, we can start the design of a suitcase yeah. from an architecture. Like that piece that it looks like a, a piece of foam coming out, a piece of steam coming out from the teapot, it was actually a pavilion that at the time of this commission we were designing from Milton Keynes. It was supposed to be built and then like the pandemic it was shut. 
But again, how really like these things they play with each other and how again like architecture could be used to do something else or different things can be used to do architecture. Uh, this is a project that we thought it could be fitted in uh, just to understand how to play with at the beginning of a project, uh, you know, when you want to uh, develop something. We were in uh, Sicily for our uh, artist residency, which didn't deal at all with architecture. We weren't asked to do any architectural like prototype at the end. And what we, were, we wanted to work with uh, was with this uh, history of Sicilian desserts. What you see here are the minne. Minne are really famous uh, desserts in Sicily because they come, although it's very fascinating because of the form, because of the breast shape, it comes from an history of pain because the saint was uh, like, it became, um, yeah, like, uh, a yeah, a, a martyr. Martyr, yeah. Yeah, that's basically behind this playful, joyous aesthetic, there's a, that's a history of pain, like that we wanted to, to make tangible again. So we were constructing a series of molds in order to spray the ricotta, which is the feeling of the dessert. Yeah. And like the visitor, actually, by again, understanding it geometrically, the visitor, they should replicate like this sort of like the gesture of screwing, like you would need to assemble your mold in order to consume like the dessert, in order to fabricate it. This was again a performance that was supposed to happen right before the pandemic. So like we have the drawings, we have like these models, but then like the actual cooking of the of the dessert it didn't happen and what we work on is exactly on this mechanism of reattaching the you know almost reattaching the top of the the breast but as well we work with the the sac -a poche you know when you make cakes and you make the filling you have this really uh, precise uh, top metal like uh, tubes where you you push the cream out and for us it was particularly important. Why? Because we were having the residency near these, um, these old shops of crafters that were still welders. And they're the only one remaining in Sicily. And for us, like, what was important is, again, like starting from very simple molds. As Sabrina said, they had nothing to do with architecture. But then starting playing like, with gestures, with geometries, with materials. Like, you start seeing opportunities. The very, very last day, like while we were packing our models, almost like by accident, we lifted them. And so we started seeing that like these cones, these like that are usually done for icing cakes, could be quite interesting chimneys, skywalks. They have like a very interesting shape and tectonics if you look at them from below. And like the low resolution of this picture is not by accident. It's just like we didn't think about it. We were packing and then one of us said, well, let's take a picture because like this is interesting. So what happened, even if no one asked us, we started like taking care of these models and understanding them like at home, like through further prototypes in our Rhino. And then a couple of years later. A couple of years later, so we had the opportunity to work on a pavilion in Rome. So we said, let's go back to that. Let's go back to aluminium. Let's go back to metal. Let's go back to a way to find uh, professionals that can work with us in constructing this, but one to one. Let's make it inhabitable. So we worked uh, on this project uh, uh, that was supposed to remain there just during the summer. Um, Aostiense in this neighborhood in Rome and we started to construct these cones uh, where you could literally walk in. And for us the challenge was like to keep recognizability of those like because it's important especially when you work with unconventional aesthetics like in architecture we believe it's important to preserve a sense of familiarity we believe like it's very important for people to recognize where certain things come from even though you would never expect that they could come from that so it's very important how do you work with saka poshis with the endings for icing cakes but you keep them literal like how do you make them like eight meters high like 10 meters wide but like so what does it mean to work like with thicknesses uh, with structure and that's where like our training like as architects like comes. How much does it weight? Um, no you want to say? No 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 that, that's no, where it's important the, like how much does it weight it's quite an important feature. One of feature. the interesting part for us was that during the summer the city gets emptied out basically in Roma everyone goes to the seaside so the actual proposal was in the middle of a car park and all the um, all the cars weren't there in the beginning and then coming towards September so one month later they started to approach 
you know, the, the site. And some people were using it, they were coming out of the car and they were telling us, this is great, it's a great uh, shadow place for my car, you know. Some other people said uh, um, during the night that they were barbecuing and all the smoke were coming out of the, of the cones. Some other, like, uh, is near like a club, uh, some young people used to have it and as amplifiers uh, using speakers underneath. So the, everyone was really using it in different ways and this is exactly what we wanted. But it's important like to underline and to highlight like uh, it's spatial behavior because yeah. if you think about it like when you put metal like outside in the heat in Rome you would think like it's crazy hot but it's not because like these stainless steel sheets are not like flat but they are inclined mm -hmm. so the 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 sun bounces of those and also like the fact that they are like cantilevered and you have an opening from a climatic point of view they play like chimneys so it was quite fresh below it it was like quite pleasant <laughs> so people like all the activities that Sabrina mentioned they really started organizing them like spontaneously and what was interesting is that like it was supposed to stay there for three months yeah. but at the end of these three months the citizens actually they started talking with the municipality in order to leave it there and they asked us to redesign the parking lot around it and there's a very important text for like the architects that are working in public space which is called like from parking lot to public space and here we were super happy because like finally we really threw such if you want a playful like installation we were really managing to steal some space to parking lots which in Italy is quite a thing <laughs> even though Italy is a complicated country so they told us that it would have stayed and then one day they yeah, said that it needed to be removed and again architecture plays an interesting role in that because like again even if it's big it's very easy to assemble it and disassemble it because like the way it's constructed you will have like the foundations are foundations are basically these concrete panettoni, we call them panettoni, they are like kind of cylinders with a dome, and then you will have like tripods, which are just, we, we are, they, that are just like inserted yeah. in the hole, and then like the structure of the cones is plugged without the need of any screw, and then like the pieces are screwed, so they are like quite sophisticated architecturally, so this allowed us to have like a solution even with short notice, and so we were able to move it, and you can see it right now in front of Stazione Tiburtina in Rome, so it was able to have a second life, it got a, a bit of restyling, <laughs> like we, we had to paint it in order to somehow <laughs> insert it in the context, wherever, whatever that means, so we weren't really sure about like the repainting okay, at right. the beginning, but we are relatively happy with this and one beautiful thing also is that because we're also between always uh, n it's not often that we're present during the construction uh, here it was uh, really beautiful to see that actually we were allowed to take away the um, the stills that at the beginning instead that they were added uh, with our noticing you know yeah because like not even to take away like they were again but for example because they seem details but like we believe it's very important like to be bold with aesthetics and with ingredients but to keep on being like very rigorous very precise when it comes like to construct these pieces of architecture and if you can see in here like we weren't there on the construction side on the first assembling and so even if like in the original design there, there weren't like the triangles on the perimeter because those plugs the cables they work like they were added in here that were removed as you can see it's not only an aesthetic detail but it is much more inviting because like it's way more porous way more permeable and actually you can have like this sort of effect look it looks it's like, like a costume yeah. like it floats and like this guy it seems that he's wearing it we have 10 more okay 10 minutes is that okay yeah no. No. Okay. no because yeah and again, like we wanted to conclude this project with this, saying like that these shadows are like the, the, like the, the, the expansion of the project, like and the way like it projects itself in public space and what it believe, what, what it builds, and so how it's really a welcoming device with a with an unconventional aesthetic, but mainly meant to construct engagement in public space, which is a very peculiar point for us, and we want to show you how we approach also this idea like of building in public space and how do we deal with the uh, temporality with permanence and what's important for us this is a very let's say fast project that we did in Vienna in 2017 when yeah when they asked us to repave in a week with 
a thousand euros, a hundred meters long square. So what we decided to do is like working with tape. And what we decided to do, since we wanted to make an impact and we wanted the citizens to really talk with the municipality to convince them to make like longer term project in there. We saw that there was a kindergarten next to the square. So we thought, well, if we manage to engage with the kids, they're gonna talk with their parents and the parents perhaps are gonna do something. So what we decided to do, like at the end of each day, we wanted to give the feeling that the intervention was concluded. So it's conceived as a crocodile, a series of turtles, a fish, and then finally, an overall geometrical pattern. So that at the end of each day, coming back from kindergarten, like the kids would see an animalistic figure in the square and would like engage with it. In order to do such a thing, you need, in a week, you need to engineer it quite seriously. Because if you want to build a fish in public space with tape and you want to collaborate with like 10, 15 people in order to make it in time, again, it's a serious architectural so matter. So is the number like, of people involved, is the type of audiences, is direction, is orientation, is layout? Uh, where do we start? Where do we end? Um, where do we end? Where do we end? For example, the fish never happened because it rained and like the rain destroyed our peace. But that night, and we were desperate because we didn't conclude the thing, this lady came down the street, in the street from the overlooking flats and she told us that she has been taking pictures for the entire week and she made the booklet in order to go talking with the municipality. So the intervention was done for us. Like, we didn't really need it to construct something else. Like, really, its impact was somehow successful. It wasn't important, the, uh, the actual outcome, uh, but we work through architecture to achieve uh, different things. So we use sometimes the term that we uh, design support structures for various things to happen. Um, yeah, how it's important, sorry. architecture becomes a medium for togetherness, for conviviality, and like not by accident, like the studio that we teach and we do together at the RCA, it's titled convivialism. So what does it mean to really use like and food is an amazing medium to trigger conviviality and therefore like to trigger engagement in public space. I wouldn't go here, we'll go to the next one. No? I wouldn't, yeah. What would you show? Okay. So talking about, let's say, engagement in public space, uh, we designed a series of devices that we call inhabitables, inhabitable yes. tables. And we have a bunch of them, perhaps since maybe, maybe we, we are running scroll, out of yeah. time, we can show you the ones that we believe are more interesting. This is for an, an itinerant... Yeah. Uh, an itinerant cart uh, that we propose for the London Festival of Architecture, where we will put in conversation three different uh, platforms. Uh, one was olio, recycling and exchanging like uh, tools of cooking. Um, and it was like olio and... Well, uh, Sorry. Okay, then you won't explain no, no. it. Uh, <laughs> uh, Olio Caboodle that was like uh, able to recharge, uh, you know, your cart uh, from the city and Habab, uh, where they have uh, a platform for um, fridge, uh, community fridge uh, around London. It was but basically any, yeah. an itinerant community fridge that would serve multiple communities from Smithfield Market to East London, somehow collecting leftovers from supermarkets, organizing like dinners for the community and redistributing them to food banks. And for us, it was important to construct something that could like engage with local businesses, but also something that would plug, again, with the aesthetics, the iconography of the city, like it originated from Smithfield Market, not only like conceptually, but also like from a design point of view, what does it mean like almost like to take a piece of the market and like together with the architectural history that it has and to bring it around the city. So on tables. <laughs> on tables, again, really we are quite obsessed and we made like quite a lot of speculative proposals like with tables somehow trying to play like with their scale and with uh, the possibility of assembling like uh, weird ones, unconventional ones and understanding which are the components that are needed to do so. In here, for example, we started playing with a hybrid between uh, a referee, tennis chair, a fun vault and how to make it climbable, inhabitable and how like to assemble those together in order to construct like what you saw before, a sort of portico, colonnade or a table at the scale of the city. And one of the main references that we always use in our projects is this, uh, the illustrations of Robinson, um, which this one is called the space economy uh, at a, re a wedding reception. It so it's for quite, itself, I would yeah, say, it's just, no? yeah. And like, some of them are speculative, 
but some of them like they're originated uh, from real projects from from things that we really tried like in public space or and they have a history like as you saw before with the Saka Post project we have like projects that are somehow very fast but then they evolve in time they stay with us and they often have a second life they can be often I wouldn't say readapted but I would say like proposed and like broad like in different contexts this is a, a table that like we constructed with students in the countryside outside of, uh, of budapest with space saloon and it was basically like playing again with the proportions and with the possibility of inhabiting a table and understanding like the relationship between below the table and above the table it was constructed if you want wrongly but on purpose in like a week. in a week there were like multiple pieces, but the way we decided to construct it is to assemble like through different beams, geometrical beams, a series of plywood panels, and then to have like this gigantic, if you want, pizza that needed to be, let's say, unfolded in order to be sliced and in order to have like multiple pieces. What was interesting is that like the drawing was conceived at the beginning as an act of negotiation because I can have a weird slice of the pizza, but I need to negotiate the border with the people that are next to me. My border is your border. And so the thing is like we have these pieces, but in order to make it happen, we had to put in play that construction method. But then... And then, it, I mean, uh, we, we constructed the scale of the, of the landscape, and then we came back to home, and we started to work on this kind of opening, these gestures of like unfolding. And we tried to understand the kind of... Um, yeah, position that each one, uh, you know, um, take place when you're inside a table. We, we really and liked it. And we said, <laughs> can we give a second life to this project? No, let's show them because they might not know no, no. what is it. And then we started to design it for uh, this butcher um, in Tuscany. And we started to understand that how can we have different cuts of meat or how can we teach because we wanted to uh, introduce uh, uh, meat consumption uh, to children at he elementary asked us, school. He yeah. asked us basically, like, this guy, this butcher, like, saw the table and he told us, like, can we make a device for me to teach conscious meat consumption to kids? Yeah. So, like, how do you convince? Like, we rebuilt it, so we made, like, these ceramic miniatures and then, yeah. usual thing, like, we drew it because, like, in Hungary, it wasn't drawn. It was done by hand on the spot. So we started redrawing it, we started understanding the structure, and Two weeks ago, finally, we, we built, built it. it. So you're gonna see just like few pictures from construction site. You can see the carpenters that are finishing to assemble it. But again, like these now hinge pieces that weren't there like in Hungary and they needed to be like carefully conceived by us once at home in order to optimize the requirements of the butcher and in order to optimize the structural possibility. They give to the table like a lot more of three-dimensionality. Like it has now on one hand, more sculptural possibilities on the other hand like it's quite interesting like the way you can perform with it like the way you can like conduct maintenance or the way you can inhabit it and the way like it provides a figure in the landscape and for us uh, how we take care of the tables uh, or uh, sorry of the table of the projects and the afterlife of a project is very important uh, how it gets used so the the this project was uh, we were asked to to um, re uh, yeah to um, refurbish an to abandoned refurbish garden. This abandoned garden in this small city in the south of Italy. That Emma knows very the well. Emma knows really well. And uh, we actually started to build a topography on the garden out of this uh, cork uh, uh, material, um, and we propose a lunch. We propose a way that, uh, to interact with the people living in the town that every day through our presence from 2 to 4 p.m. we were there waiting for them to cook together and to eat together. Um, so in a, from a design point of view, sometimes you think it's just a metal round uh, circle, you know? But it was the kind of a, like a use and visual throughout the small town in, Isa in in the south, we were having in the small uh, city these round uh, um, circles going around uh, because we were positioning in different places uh, and people would just follow. They knew that something was waiting for them. You know, it was a tool to exchange knowledge and to understand how would you like to use this garden? Tell us more about this. But instead of going there as architects, that we set up a meeting and we sit in a room on chairs, we try to make the activity the main uh, design tool for us to, to know 
how to appro- like to work on a but also, yeah. on a building totally and how to construct a material palette out of like multiple things yeah. in here you have like the iron but you have also tomatoes and the cork that they participate to the construction of a, if you want at the end of the day consistent material palette this is something quite important like for us trying to understand how artificial or if you want like architectural material can play with natural ones in here, this is an artist residency in 2020 where like in south of Italy they asked us to anticipate the construction of a vegetable garden. So what you see here, which is called marble salad, is now surrounded by rows of zucchini, tomatoes, aubergines. So like what we wanted to do, we wanted to use like the artifice as something that like with its polychromy can anticipate nature. So we wanted to collect like different pieces of marbles, like with different colors and with different activities, well, in order to... we didn't want to collect the marbles. We found a lot of refineries that were throwing out the scrap pieces of marbles. And a lot of cemeteries, they were taking, like, giving away all these marble pieces. And for them it was a huge issue because in a um, very remote uh, landscape of Puglia, you need to ask for maintenance to come and pick it up and it's a matter also of like economy involved. So what we said to them was like, we're gonna get rid of your scrap pieces, give it to us. So for three months, we went around to collect all of these uh, um, uh, additional pieces of marble and then we started to curate in terms of colors, in terms of heights, in terms of com- like uh, property and roughness. Because it's important to reflect how long does it take to construct yeah. something like this. If you think about it, it's a four by four, like, gigantic tile. It's only like four centimeters thick. So you need to make like an excavation, but again, only four centimeters in the ground. You need to put like four metallic profiles and then it's a dry construction. So a bunch of like uh, stones and some gravel. So it takes a day, a day and a half. But in reality, like Sabrina said, it takes several months because the budget is zero, and then so you need to construct a relationship with people, you need to convince them that you're making them a favor, and like at first, you're making them a favor because we were helping them this month with like these leftovers that are too small, they cannot use them. But at first, you accept everything that they give you. Then you start, again, we are architects, to curate and to be picky, no? With their properties. So it really takes a lot. How long does it take? It's very hard to say. And uh, this was, is the last project that we want to show you because it's for the first time we really wanted to work with an edible ingredient as a construction material. At the time. At the time. Like, then th- this is like, is before like some of the projects that you already saw. <laughs> okay. Um, We're in Mexico City? Yeah. So this is a pavilion which is called Gastronomic Palapa that like was proposed for Mexico, for Mextropoli 2020, which is the biggest uh, architectural festival in Central and South America. We won this competition to build it like in March 2020, but then due to the pandemic, we built it in 2021. But again, the project started a lot before, and it started From with this book, which it has nothing to do with Mexico, it has nothing to do with like what you'll see in the pavilion, but like this book, made us obsessed with something that I was talking about in the beginning, like this idea of inhabiting certain spaces which are meant for production and are not meant to be inhabited, that are related to food production, and that we believe they would be amazing if we could inhabit them, like cod dryers, that like, as you can see, like these spaces, like where, for example, you have a ceiling constructed, this is like in Norway, like cod is very popular in in Portugal and that book comes from there but in here like you can see how like amazing could be like having a space a pavilion that stops being just a contemplative space but that can be related to some active processes like the drying processes like how would it be nice we always wanted to do something like that and I think that we have a lot of typology also in the north of Italy the image on the left is this church that is used as a collective gathering meeting food to dry the, the, the corn, you know, but the corn becomes also a facade in the church. So you have a church and a facade, you have the edibles, and then you have this kind of like uh, uh, historical references of the how Nor- in Norway we have almost these like ceiling heights of cod. And I mean, part of our culture, uh, cultural background in Sicily, we are used to see these um, pepper, 
the chili, the, the, the chili, the chili uh, yeah, chilies, uh, restaurants of chilies. And when we started to look uh, from a reference point of view, from a visual point of view, about the cultural uh, element of, of this, um, of this, we started to look uh, and collect uh, postcards on eBay. That we started to see that really we're talking exactly. We didn't invent anything because, uh, like, we didn't say no. that. Like, why the chili? So the thing is, we were obsessed with dryers. Yeah. We were obsessed with cuts. So when we saw this competition for a pavilion in Mexico. It was very quick. We said, okay, you know what, like, let's do a chili dryer. Let's do an architecture through chilies. And that's where we discovered that we didn't invent anything. And, and here, already, they, they were, you know, they are used as a sort of, like, a, um, structural material that has a, this shadow, like, this casting shadow on top of the facade. We start to look at the properties of, of this image, really, and to decompose the image, to start to understand how to use uh, this into a pavilion. And we started to have this uh, frame where we could, uh, um, the original idea was to ask the people to bring their own chilies, uh, to attach the chilies to the architecture, and to allow the chilies to dry throughout the months of the festival. So in that case, we started to research on the different typologies of chilies which one will go from green to red, how heavy they are, how much do they leave the seeds and the spice, because otherwise you're going to enter, you're going to just like smell like uh, something too strong, you will not be able to like uh, go through, which was the best chili. And then uh, pandemic arrived, I mean, and then we were actually um, postponed. So that meant that the season wasn't good to dry the chilies. So we couldn't fake it. So we needed to just use the already dried chilies. We didn't have time. It wasn't, you know, how this pavilion was actually diverted in a way completely because of seasonality. And it's important because we're working with edibles. And if you think about it, like the chilies, when they're already, let's say, dry, they have a lot less volume. So we needed to reconstruct like this, uh, yeah. let's say, volumetry of the chili threads. Mm -hmm. And that's why we were using like this piece that you see here, which is an organic piece called zacates that is used like, like to produce sponges. So in order to give a sort of like structure to chilies, because as Sabrina was saying, like the thing is you want to work with chilies, then you need to play with chilies as if it was an architectural material. So you need to understand like its properties, uh, like not only the material ones, but also like the visual ones. And you need to understand how to work with it. But it was important. We didn't say in one of the slides before, but like for us, it was important to construct an architecture out of shadows, out of lines. So it was important, like also to take care of like the support of the chilies, to take care of the intra of the infrastructure that would like provide the dryer. The budget, again, even in here, it was very very low. So in order to keep the proportions, the pavilion is quite big. It's like almost 18 meters long. It's nine meters high in its highest point. So it has like a lot of proportion. Oh. Like it was in, in in order to keep it, like we needed to play just with one type of component. So everything that you see is built with a V-shaped metallic profile, three inches by three inches. So we needed to make like the structure like through crosses, like the central spine through another cross, the main structure through T's and the other portals through V's. So also like how do you provide a certain like type of characteristic and certain strength? We well, send we them. Move, yeah, yeah, we send the drawings. So we move. Uh, we go to Mexico City, and the only drawings that they printed was this one. <laughs> so we just try to, you know, work out uh, with the uh, with the welders uh, on site the kind of openings because we had these two main openings from one uh, from the front and one at the at the curvature. We wanted to construct this cathedral of Chile. So then we had these tongues sticking out to use as tables that we were wish also that as the one in Belmonte, the project there, with the heat we would be able to cook, but then because of pandemic and hygienic like reason, then we couldn't do that. Um, but what was also interesting for us is that uh, some of the feedback that came in terms of uh, etymology of the tables is that these red tongues were sticking out as if that when you eat chilies you had this like burning yeah because like know, at like first we wanted to like in spanish you need to know that like the word tables translates mesa, mesa. that etymologically like is the same of misa which is mass celebration so like also etymologically like the table is connected like to the mass to the performing of like things on it so for us it was important almost like to obstruct 
the openings with tables. So I'm not gonna enter, but like interior and exterior are put into communication by tables. So we're gonna see that same table. But we were super happy since, as we told you before, we are obsessed with familiarity and recognizability when people told us, these look like the red tongue that you have when you eat chilies. So it was like unconscious. It wasn't like that we were looking for it, but couple of things like, yeah, as Sabrina was saying, we were supposed to build it like in March during the dry season and it was supposed to be built like in Alameda Central, which is the biggest space in Mexico City. It counts a million visitors per weekend. So we were expecting people like to basically get all the chilies in a weekend to really appropriate the pavilion, almost to destroy it. And this and is what really, this is really what we wanted. And leave just uh, at the end of the festival, we were aiming to have uh, everyone taking away the chilies. So you will remain just with the skeleton of the architecture. Um, but then we had to move the site, so, but it was important for us because this site was a much better, considered better site, you know. It was the presidential garden. Um, the former uh, the presidential former, garden. Yeah. And then what happened is actually the, the way that it's public comes in uh, is completely different than like uh, um, a, a huge public square. You needed a ticket, you needed to get in, you had opening hours. So you're not, the architecture doesn't really perform how, how it should be because it's just restricted in its use. So what is a good site? Is it a site that somehow optimizes if you want the tectonics of, of your pavilion or is it, or is it a site that really optimizes its usage? And For how us, of can course. we talk about architecture without talking about actually the people that are involved? Um, Sorry. Well. Sorry. So what we wanted, like, again, this is a reference from Hong Kong, a festival where people appropriate. That's quite nice to just show them, of though. Of course. Of course. <laughs> This is really what we wanted, like one of our favorite. Yeah, references. When we were living in Bangkok, we came often to Hong Kong and to this small island, which is called the Chiang Chao. I'm sure that I'm saying it wrong completely, but this was like a festival that takes place once a year in this island. And it's, uh, it's involved all the community there. And they built these Ban Towers. It's like the highest tower that I ever seen in my life, just uh, built out of uh, buns custard buns and you have this race that of young people that come from adolescent to adulthood that go there and as much as months they take is like a sort of like initiation of good luck but what happened here here is really like a, a major symbol for us of how an architecture can become a device for a performativity that takes action in the public space and that's what we expected if we really managed to build it in Alameda Central while in the former presidential garden, of course, like we staged events, so we were organizing events and like this building could perform as a public pantry with like chilies taken away. So like it could be an architecture to be appropriated, to be consumed. But again, it needed to be curated. And so we couldn't have like that sort of spontaneity. Because like, as we said, like you need to make a lot of like efforts in order to construct the supporting structure for an architecture, which ultimately is made out of chilies. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? Yeah. I can pass the mic around. Hi. Thank you. That was really good. Um, I'm really interested in actually the smell of this yeah. pavilion. Like, did it change throughout the construction? And yeah, I was just wondering, like, that, that sensorial of effect. Course, of course, not as much as we hoped. Because the thing is, when we were going back uh, to, if we go back to these slides, you know, to this uh, slide, if it could be built during, like, the wet season, and so we could have used, like, all these uh, varieties, of course, like, each of them, has a different smell and they dry with different timings. So you would have like, you would have had a ceiling like that would, let's say, change according to the kind of varieties. And then it's quite nice because you go there as you would go to a shop that sells different types of plaster. You just pick like them based on color, but also based on smell, based on drying processes, while having built it with already dried chilies, like the smell was a bit more stable. It was very intense from the very, very, very beginning. 
like almost disturbing. It was like a very, no, but like, yeah. it was like very intense. So it was almost like very nice from the start, but then of course, like it's more stable because like the drying has already happened. I think one thing that we wanted to also emphasize was the major difference between going out from outside that you see just the gray lines and the shadow of these chilies on the floor. And then once in, you were having this like strong impact inside this cloister. And also the way that we have the, hi like the height of the chilies were also designed uh, for, from children to adults to, to be able to smell. So also the children could smell it because sometimes you have, you design it, you know, at, the, at different scales and children are not involved. Yeah, so we try through geometry also to address that a bit. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, so, um, well, thank you so much. It was incredible. Thank you for making the time for being with us and inspire us with all of this amazing work. Um, I have a couple of perhaps detailed questions about uh, some of the installations. So in this case, for example, did people at the end pick up the chilies and did the chilies kind of were, were they brought home or, you know, were people kind of involved in the fact of, because initially it was, the idea was about people bringing their own chilies, uh, how that change with the, yeah, with the resolution of the fact that seasonality didn't match with the overall idea. So that's one question. And then in terms of scale, of course, um, it's beautiful because all of your projects really kind of, um, play with the idea of playfulness and togetherness together to kind of bring um, in also the, this idea of involving a diversity of audiences, right? So from children onwards. But in terms of the um, scale, so your cones, your salt cones, um, of course the scale was very different. How was that determined? Was it the size of the tiles or, yeah. And then finally, the materiality that you used for the tables in Belmonte. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because they were washed and yes. kind of, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Do, yeah? Maybe speaking about the, the chilies, like the, the main thing is related again to the degree of publicness of the site. It's like, it's a place which in Mexico City was opened only a couple of years ago and it's like, somehow like people still need to get used to its new let's say i wouldn't even call it publicness because like again it's open from 10 until 5 it's guarded so there were like security guards next to the pavilion so somehow like you don't feel that you can behave like very you, you don't feel that like you are entitled to take them away unless someone tells you and that's why we had to organize some events where like either ours or like the organizers of the festival were present so that people felt allowed to interact with it otherwise you run somehow the, the people were feeling well am i stealing something while if you put exactly the same thing like in a different place where like people are used to behave spontaneously and are used like to appropriate in the good sense of the term what they find is like it's clear that it's available for them you have a completely different i think it's also interesting that uh, because of that in venice so when you are in the church uh, in cabras in sardinia everyone was coming in fishermen were coming in uh, uh, people that just passing by with their dogs were coming in uh, touching the cones uh, is made uh, because it's a site specific project when moved the same exactly the, exactly the same one in venice the context uh, and the the the, the you know the gallery atmosphere completely twisted the meaning of something so people were just very scared to to come close they wouldn't they were just looking at it is is weird because in um, you know that's why architecture means so much to us in the church you were having a small platform just that we left a 25 centimeter gap that you know like you needed to walk a very thing but you were in the middle of the cones you were surrounded by them so you had the possibility to also look at them from above in plan not only from an elevation point of view yeah. when you go to venice you have these that is almost blocked 
So you just have one perspective of the, of the work of art. So it's really, and it becomes a work of art immediately, you know? So that uh, it's quite... No, um, for the scale, I feel like what's interesting is like... the, well, the, the main question, restriction yeah, the, were the ovens. No, but like, if you think about <laughs> well. it, but, but, but yes, of course. Like it's the tiles of the church and like what you can like, and the, the maximum height of the oven. But I feel like that, I mean, thank you for the question because I think it gives us the opportunity of like clarifying an aspect. Like as you saw, I mean, somehow like we like to produce multiple things which are architecturally grounded but that are not necessarily architectural like performances uh, events objects but like the main role of architecture for us like when we want to say it intellectually we say that like this is a sort of filtering framework for us to grasp reality but like the truth is is that like really we think through it and sometimes we really need it in order to have like let's say, ideas tangible for us. For example, in, ben in Sardinia, we knew that we wanted to work with perhaps salt. We knew that we wanted to make that auction. We knew that we wanted to represent the intersection between architectural landscape and, um, and food production, but we didn't really know how. It was like very vague in our mind. Like the project was like, was like so unclear. And then a day we happened to see the church, we happened to enter and everything was clear. We said, we want to work in here. We want to do something inside this church. And then like that space with its like super clear spatial characteristics starts giving hierarchy to our thoughts. But even like to the conceptual ones, like everything starts making sense because we find like a place. Even when it comes like to, to Mexico, like somehow like the fact of having conceived the pavilion starts from the characteristic of Alameda Central. Of course, there are like certain feelings. We knew we wanted to work with chilies. We knew we wanted to work with like certain sensations, but like the thing was, okay, it's there. It's in Alameda Central or it's like, it has to do with a specific piece of architecture. So in that sense, architecture for us, it's really a trigger. We could never design a performance without starting from a purely, let's say, architectural set of those. But sometimes it's more about also, for example, this project in, uh, in, uh, in the south of Italy, in Belmonte, in Calabria. Uh, why we chose tomatoes? Because we work a lot with, in, I mean, we go to markets to eat. <laughs> and then uh, from the market sellers, we really get an understanding of dynamics and how the, the city like, uh, gets active or works on our daily ordinary uh, life. So then uh, once we were there, we said, what is it that we can buy? And we saw this map for them, the uh, Pomodoro of Belmonte is such a symbolic uh, product that it's, it's um, we started to work with the sectioning of the tomato, you know, but until the way that, until the time that we had this tomato, we didn't know how to approach a new site. And it's also very dangerous for architects because sometimes more and over, more and more in this project, you've been asked or you do a competition or you get a commission and you come from far away, you come in uh, and then you leave. So you leave a void, you leave a gap uh, when you're not there. So these allow us to also have uh, people that take care, that are from there and they, you pass you know, the, the things to them. Because, for, and we are the mediators in this communication. So maybe we just emphasize and we kind of understand the, the first uh, glimpse of what to work with. It can be tomatoes, it can be metal, it can be the craft. But then we leave and we know that something is gonna continue after our departure, you know? Yeah. But even in here, for example, that's why I placed on this picture, because we knew we wanted to, to work with tomatoes, but like, we ended up doing a lunch, perhaps because of the properties of the site. It's like this garden that like, as Emma knows now, is like amazingly refurbished by Horizontale. At the time, it was like full of like construction debris. And for us, like they asked us to do something like, so the, 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 the requirement was doing something in that garden. We knew that we wanted to use tomatoes. But like when we saw the garden, when we saw that there was basically no budget, like the debris were like arranged in a very specific way and we didn't touch it. So there was like this sort of hill in the middle and then like almost like two natural hills on the side. So we said, you know what, like 
it's already a seating device. Because like, you can have like a sort of central spine where to put things on and you have like a system of seatings on the sides. Let's cover it with something soft and that's it. We don't need to do anything else. So if it's a seating system, we can really eat these tomatoes. So we decided that in the end we didn't touch the tomatoes themselves and like we used them as raw ingredients, but it was everything, again, we had like raw thoughts, what Sabrina was describing, like markets, exchanges, tomatoes, what do we do with those? Then we see the place and like just reflecting upon like it's very simple, spatial characteristics, then something else yeah. can become tangible. Yeah. Yeah. I guess to conclude and to tie it back into our unit's work, really seeing um, the table not as a separation from, but very much an extension of the ground. And like you said, this almost as if coming out of the ground and engaging in this act of, of eating uh, very much with the ground as present. So thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Uh, I think One more question. I don't know. Thank you so much. That was so impressive and enjoy throughout. It's also really interesting because you went through all the processes from the start to diverting to difficulties. I was wondering maybe two or three. Sabrina mentioned um, about the differences of the people from Sardinia to Venice. I was wondering, so you worked in Mexico, you worked in many places in Italy, in Bangkok, in, so you encountered different cultures, different way of being or life. I was wondering how, what kind of um, understanding the culture you made through your, your realizing projects, also challenges and difficulties about dealing with different, different contexts or cultures. Another one is more probably uh, admin part. Do you, so I understand that you are often commissioned or comp won the competitions. Do you also propo uh, make your own dream and then propose, yes. approach people too? Yes, <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I think it's important because when you graduate uh, in architecture, then the only way to interfere and to be part of the events uh, that takes place in a city usually is either through um, competitions, which are really hard to win uh, because nowadays uh, you have 500 entries for <laughs> Um, it's a bit of a lottery. It's a bit of a lottery. Uh, so our methodology now is that we work on our things and we we try to work together uh, as a duo. We always, you know, we teach together, we work together. So we have this kind of pot of ideas, and we have this archive of ours that sometimes we say, okay, we saw this open call, let's try it, or we knock at doors and we say, you know what? I think we have this project that could be good here. So I think it's also like uh, how to change this perspective as well. Uh, because for artists it's not like, uh, or maybe in other disciplines it's more, you're not so relegated to such an open, like, uh, you know, abstract open core system. But really, system. the, the, the Sakabosch Pavilion, um, like in 2019, at the end of the presidency, after having done that and having observed like their interesting property, the interesting properties of those models, we started, designing like that pavilion. So when they gave us that commission to build something in Ostiense in Rome and they asked us to design it in five days, we had them there. And we said, well, okay, let us, like we have something. And of course, like we are also like, we try to be rigorous. It's not that we wanna somehow try to squeeze it in any kind of opportunity. But like in there, they asked us to make something playful, to make something metallic. So we thought that it was really the perfect chance to introduce like that playful pavilion, but it was already there. Similarly to the table that like, we, pro we were the ones proposing it to the butcher after having observed how like it went, how it went like in, in, in Budapest. So we said, you know what, like this thing, let's evolve it and then let's look for the framework. And then that framework, yes, could be a competition or could be something, someone that we know or could be an artist residency. And most of our projects, that's why we try to link and to thread them together, but they are open projects, they are not finished projects. Everything can change depending if a pavilion is for a competition or something, then if we change the material of it, it can be something else, you know, it can be a toy, it can be something. So then um, we never, 
yeah, we never have an end to a thing. And um, the way that we involve or that we try as much as possible to uh, work in collaboration with, uh, with people is to be honest, we found ourselves after seven years now of doing things together. Um, I know it sounds a bit naive maybe, but it's about empathy. Uh, which I don't, uh, we still don't know, you know, we, I don't think we can teach that, but it's about really um, being present and offer your time is a different kind of involvement in the city. It's about slowness, it's about, uh, you know, being there and, and observe what happens and to don't come with preconception and don't come with like this set in stone ideas. Is really to observe and be truthful to each to reality, which you know you can never be because in the moment that you make a film or you make something, it's, sub it's subjective. But it's really to observe and to understand uh, how the the city works uh, or the different scale of something works. Um, and that's the, that's in the Bangkok. Uh, yeah. It was fun for us because when you don't have the same language, it's much more fun. It's like you try to exchange and to understand through craft. That's why for us craft and makers are the most important people usually because they, you share knowledge just through sitting next to each other and to understanding hands-on how to do something. So that's why mostly we, uh, we work uh, um, with different materials uh, or facilities uh, or things that have uh, a really strong emphasis on materiality, yeah, and material culture. Um, oh, I mean, in general, like adapting ideas, like both physically or conceptually, sometimes comes with bad connotations. We believe it's possible. We believe like it's a slow process. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort. Like when you scale up, scale down, or readapt something, but it's possible. And that's why the title of the lecture, we didn't put emphasis on it, but it's also like the title of the project in Venice. Sea changes that like in Italian, we decided to translate it rather than radical transformations, we decided to translate it with possible transformations. Meaning like sea changes are possible. If you put like, if you're serious about them, and you can be serious and playful, but like if you're serious, precise, you allow like, the right amount of time for yourself, for the audience, but they're definitely possible. And they're needed, actually. So this idea of conscious adaptation of things. And like, was there any consideration of concept of time as well? Because like, uh, is there any meaning of each cone holding different time scale? Because you told about uh, if you put oven and then because of the time, the size, the older time took different. And I believe that uh, making botarga is not just using a salt. And it's also some kind of, uh, the botarga is actually a result of accumulation of time. So I was wondering, is, was there any concept of time including that project? Absolutely, yeah. Um, it's really beautiful what you said because actually, as a, um, if you go to the yeah. Botarga bits where he's massaging the Botarga, <laughs> um, yeah. one of the people that we met there, Nicola, was uh, actually um, his job <laughs> was just to massage the Botarga. <laughs> so his uh, his way. This is a really like important bit because uh, when you take this um, mallet row out of the salt. Uh, for 30 days uh, or even four hours when it gets really hot. So there is a whole study of a calendar that we wrote down as a chronology of when the salt gets in for how long, depending on the time of the month. Because in August it's much hotter, so it needs to get on the salt much less. Um, but for example, when you take out of the salt in 30 days, the salt becomes orange because it absorbs, because of the porosity, it gets all the things. So we really wanted to work with that salt, but then we realized that we had to open the Biennale in May and then we couldn't uh, take all that salt. So that's why we had to use just white salt. But it would have been nice actually to take this, which from a flavor point of view, it was taking all the, all the smell of the fish. And uh, um, he, he acts uh, as uh, a tower of stratigraphy. 
because in a way it's like uh, different heights, it creates a topography and for us also, uh, we didn't mention that, but in the wax uh, of Botarga, we wanted to implement the smell of the, of the, um, of the herbs from the pond because those herbs are the one that the mallet eats throughout all the month, uh, all the year. And, and for us was also important the way that the fishing facilities were designed in the 19th centuries is that they were made not out of cement but out of bamboo or willow. And that, why was that? Because uh, basically they had like uh, poles of bamboos all around. The fish comes with a current, it gets in and out. So then how do you recognize that the mullet has babies and therefore can be caught for botarga? You know that because with the bamboo, when the fish was coming in and it was pregnant, then she couldn't go out because the bamboo was too thin. So they knew that the mullet staying there, they were just ready to be caught. And the way that the fish still right now in Cabra is that 12 people goes into the water, they dip themselves in onto the torso and they take out by hand these fishes. So it was quite beautiful also a whole study that we didn't implement here, but all the gestures of the people almost as a dance to take out that. Um, Even, so uh, maybe I didn't respond actually no, to that. But no, I feel, I think <laughs> it is like that. Sabrina is very fascinated about the fishermen yeah. and cameras. So like it's a whole process. No, I feel like something important to be said. I mean, and that's why I put this slide, like of course, like they're optimized in terms of dimension, uh, like there's a rhinoceros script in order to understand yes. how to have them. But like they're mainly four categories. So you have like 14 centimeters high, roughly, yeah, because they're all done by hand artisanally, but roughly 14 centimeters, 20 centimeters, 26 centimeters, and 32 centimeters high. Of course, like the bigger they are, the more time you need. And on one hand, like it needs to be somehow acknowledged. And so like we needed to engineer the production, how many of them you can put together in the same pot, in the same tray for the oven. On the other hand, consciously, like on the online platform, you need to make the same donation, like no matter if you, if you buy, if you want to have like the small one or the big one, because like we want to somehow also symbolize the fact that like time is a value, but like is is a value in relationship of the amount of care that you put into something. And like the Botarga, of course, like some of them they ferment for six months, some of them they ferment like for three years, but like there's not a strict logic relationship. So the longer, the better. Like and that's why perhaps Sabrina wanted to focus on the act of massaging. Like like. We, f we believe it's important like doing things where you can recognize the amount of time that like and the amount of care that you put into something so like it's interesting like to do things by hand when it makes sense it's interesting to reconnect with crafts but we feel like it's also dangerous to establish like bionivocal bionivocal like relationship between like like so that like it, it becomes like super strict so like the longer the better. Yeah. It's more like time meant as like care and somehow like engagement, involvement that you put into I mean, into in a, a couple of days I want to show you the auction site, but I think I'm still working. Um, but you will see that the, each cone, when you click on the, on the round, you will see that some of them has some uh, difference in colors and also some lost the salinity of it. And therefore, um, on the church, it was quite interesting because when we left them, uh, they left almost like, uh, you know, like a, um, an aura around it. So it, dry, I think it dries out. Uh, it dries out. We didn't yeah, damage we didn't any, any But then uh, what is nice <laughs> is that when you test something on site, so when we had the first activation, you kind of see the <coughs> traces, the memory of what was there. And I think this is really interesting when you play with like, you know, a two weeks course that you can try to go on site, test something, leave it overnight, come back and see maybe how this can, you know, become almost an initiation of a design. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Very curious to see what you're going to produce. Yes. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. So let's continue the conversation over lunch. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.